Hey there, all you creepers and reapers. Welcome to another episode of the Femme Fatalities. I'm your co-host, is Anna, and I'm here with... Hey, grieflings and frightlings. It's Margaret, and welcome back. We, we have got a, I'm going to say a beautiful movie mm-hmm. to talk about. A very grief-centered movie. Anna, what movie are we talking about today? Well, everybody get your finest linens on and dance around the maypole because we're speaking about Midsummer. Yes, Ari Aster's film, uh, one of the many. We will be getting to some of the others uh, throughout the podcast as well. But as Margaret mentioned, this is a very grief-centric film. I think it's a great selection for our thanatologist. Uh, Before we dive too much in, Definitely know that there are several triggers. Uh, We do have uh, completion of suicide as well as um, homicide. Yeah, definitely. We're we're getting into some pretty heavy stuff. Um, Lack of support in relationships, emotional abandonment, Um, mental illness. I a lot of people have said cult situations. However. I think that's arguable. We'll get that. We'll get into that. I got some information on that. If yeah, Um, yeah. So I read uh, interviews with Ari Aster because sometimes (laughs) either Anna and I, sometimes both of us, will watch a movie and we go into this deep dive because we really want to know more of the thought process. And Ari thought of it as, and I love this. And tell me what you think. It's about her losing her family and then finding family. Yes. So he did not see them as a cult. He saw them as a group of people who were going to become her new family. And so Mm -hmm. with that, I don't. Yeah. I think people say cult because they disagree Mm -hmm. with the behavior. Well, and it's a different culture. It's a different culture, right? And, And I, that's honestly. It's funny that you mentioned that interview because after I saw the movie, that's exactly what I got out of it was she has a new family now. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah. Hey, Ari, we got your point. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> and then in terms of other triggers, um, the the fire scene, the ritual scene, um, animal cruelty with the bear. Um a lot of menstrual themes. So um, once again, that actually does come from a true cultural tradition, um, which we might talk about on the podcast today. Mm -hmm. But um, a lot of things to do with menstruation, coming of age, um, cycles. Yeah. Like you talk about menstruation, that cycle, Mm -hmm. life cycles. I think there was even at one point, um, their friend that took them there was talking about how from this age to this age, you're in this Mm -hmm. cycle and then this age. And so life cycles. Yes. And also um, there's additional, I guess you could say it's completion of suicide, but it's part of the tradition and culture of the people they're referred to as the Harga in this film. However, it is elder death. That's fairly brutal. Um, Mm -hmm. a lot of people had a really hard time with that scene. So, um, yeah, just lots of triggers, but I think it's a great watch. So, um, you know, it's fine for me. (laughs) It's fine for me. Yeah. Yeah. This also, I feel like is a movie. I don't know about you that grows on me. The first time Mm -hmm. I watched it, I think I was like, uh, that's okay. Mm -hmm. I think the first time I saw it, I went in with the hype. Mm -hmm. of the movie and so then it was everybody was making like oh my gosh this movie and so I'm like what was everybody talking Mm -hmm. about on rewatches it's like okay this movie is beautiful and I can see Mm -hmm. all the dynamics and this everything that's coming into play then yeah and I like I have to say I saw it um with two of my friends in the theater um, after work one night and I still very much was in my grief journey I think it came out in what 2019 um, I think so yeah and so um it was like probably a year year and a half ish after my grandma died I was still 
going through a lot in relation to her death. And I felt like I had a lot of parallels between myself and Danny, um, just in terms of the emotional abandonment, those sorts of things that I went through. Um, when I left the theater, I actually felt better than I had felt in a really long time. So it was almost like a catharsis seeing it. Although I will say it was a really awkward watch in a room full of people you didn't know. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> but, but I kept making jokes throughout the movie because you could feel the tension in the theater. And, um, you know, during the, um, you uh, impregnation bonding scene um I can specifically remember everybody was dead quiet in the theater and I was like and that's how I lost my virginity and everybody just lost it and was like dying laughing um so I mean I think it's a good movie to watch watch it with someone like that you're comfortable with because there are some moments that we would deem as very strange bizarre and awkward in terms of the behavior according to our society that we live in um but i would go into it don't think it's a documentary but definitely go into it and understand that when they take this trek to spend time with this group they have completely different rituals cultures and traditions than we're used to in the united states yes and i love how you bring that up that this is their going to explore another culture and that's exactly what it is so like Anna's saying look at it more like a documentary because and Ari Asher did do he did do his research he wanted mm -hmm. to honor Scandinavian culture what is that like northern European yeah, culture like that Nordic, he northern at. European yeah um and it's very I mean there are some things like because I spent some time in Bavaria during my teenage years there there are some things that I recognize I'm like oh I know what that is and um you know so it is definitely based on his research it's not just like oh let me make up this group of people and all these things and um I really I enjoy the culture that you know this group that he kind of features in the film because everyone has a purpose whatever age sector you're in right and you know like your beginning of life to your end of life what that all is going to look like um I would say it's probably way less stressful for them than it is for those of us living here in the United States um but also just the sense of community so we start out you know Donnie loses her sister and her parents very horrifically um, she has absolutely no support. Like, we know that they're pretty much her only family. Her boyfriend, Christian, ugh, um, he's a douche. He's very self-absorbed. Everybody's in grad school. Um, he's not supportive at all. Like, actually, when he gets the call from her, he's complaining about her. Mm -hmm. um, you know, although I do often wonder her study buddy friend, I was like, where was she? Because they seemed pretty close. I'm like, mm -hmm. She probably could have been there for Danny, but then we wouldn't have had a movie, so I guess not. But uh, he's just, he gives you, like, the cringe factor. His friends are kind of blah. And then we have the fellow that is there from the village, and um, he seems, like, okay. And he's, like, you know, he tells Danny, like, I respect you, and I think you're great. and um you know, you, sh you should come too. So she goes. And I think that these American kids are like, oh, we're going to go get drunk. We're going to, you know, hook up with random people in the village. We're going to do all these things. And that's not really what it's about at all. And the film to me speaks so much about Western behaviors and self-absorption that this is such a foreign concept because people are so me-centric in our society, and this applies so strongly to change, loss, grief, all of these processes, but it's like, what am I doing to benefit me? How can I help myself? Whereas we have this community, the Harga, it's for the greater good of the group. How can we support each other? And I love the scene where Dani is just losing it, and she goes into the women's 
barn and everyone comes around her and they're holding her and they're all screaming alongside her because this is what she's needed this whole time. Someone to empathize with her, someone to sympathize, people to care. And it just really, I know a lot of people when they see the movie or they saw the movie, it's like, whoa, this is strange. This is bizarre. But to me, it was very comforting. I think you touch on, like you're saying, that community Mm -hmm. that we need that she doesn't have. So going back to the beginning, she has a sister who is bipolar, I believe they Mm -hmm. say. And so anybody that has had loved ones with mental illness, I think Danny did a great job of the actress, Ari Asher. When you have a loved one that has mental illness, they are prone to suicidality. There is this terror that people experience when they can't reach that person because their worst fear is that that person's going to complete suicide. Everybody in her world, Christian, oh, you know she's mentally ill. You know she does this all the time. And a thing in my field I hear all the time when it comes to people with mental illness, they're doing it for attention. And that dismissiveness right there for me, as soon as somebody says they're dealing with suicidality and they've worked in crisis, okay, then what's going on? I am going to assess this to make sure that you're getting the support you need. Because even if somebody wants attention and they're saying they're suicidal, there's deep pain there. They are Mm -hmm. hurting so bad that they could lead to that. And that's what happens with her sister. Tragically, her sister kills her parents and herself and all that guilt that is traumatic loss death by suicide again i feel like the movie really captured danny's experience that is when and as then ontologist anna understands this too when somebody dies by suicide that grief is so unbearable because Mm -hmm. there is survivor's guilt people that lose what could i have done differently how could i have stopped this if i had only Mm -hmm. So here Danny is and she's got Christian, an emotionally unavailable boyfriend who now is upset. His friends are upset that she has to come along on this trip because she's, she's, they don't like her to begin with. Yeah, she's like, of course she's going to be down. She's going through an insane, intense amount of grief. Like, yes. When she was crying in the, like the, um, the airplane. Mm -hmm. Oh, oh my gosh, I could relate so yeah. much. You're trying was, to be yeah. so normal. Yeah. It mm-hmm. After my mom died, we went bowling. And it just like, I ended up going to the car and just bawling my eyes out. Yeah. It was just, that's grief. You're trying mm-hmm. to do something like, let's get on the airplane. Mm-hmm. Let's live life. And it just yeah. and sidelines it's you. a lot. I remember that like, after my grandmother had died, there were times that I would be totally alone by myself in my house and something would have happened to like trigger me just in terms of like usually like a lack of sympathy or empathy or you know basically someone behaving like that Christian boyfriend guy um, in my life just like negating something that was important to me or negating my feelings whatever it was But I remember one time specifically, um, I'm not going to go into the details of the incident because anyone listening will know, if you know me, what it's in relation to, um, if I do give the details. But I literally just started shaking and crying and like holding myself and just screamed and screamed for like 15 minutes. And it was, it sucked, but it's normal grief behavior. Like if you're doing that, that is normal. Don't think there's something wrong with you. This happens to all of us. And like Margaret said, when I saw that scene with Danny, I'm like, been there, girl. Like, you know, let it out. (laughs) Because it's totally, it's gut wrenching to watch, but it is something that many of us do. Yeah, you have to pretend like life is okay. You Mm -hmm. haven't lost somebody. She has lost somebody traumatically. Her only support we can get is her parents. Mm -hmm. And it sets that up as she's trying to reach her parents. Have you talked to her? Where is she? What's going on? And she doesn't get that. 
relief of, okay, she's mm-hmm. just having a manic episode, a depressive episode. She's just whatever it is. Okay. I can breathe now. So it's like the whole movie, Danny is like holding mm-hmm. her breath. And every time we see her start to catch her breath, like when they start to do the mushrooms, when they first get there, you're almost like, yeah. okay, she's going to catch her breath. And then her grief pulls her right back yeah. out of it. And that is so in grief where you're like, okay, all right, I, I can touch the ground. I, I'm back to normal. And then something happens where you're just back in the current mm-hmm. of it. Yeah. Oh, completely. And uh, I think oftentimes when you kind of get caught in the undertow, we wish for support. We wish for someone to kind of feel what we're feeling and, and experience that level of pain or grief or sadness, anger, even whatever, you know, we we're feeling that's, we kind of wish that there's someone experiencing it with us or at least witnessing or listening to what we're going through. Um, and I think just her going in the bathroom to emote and the isolation that you can see her experiencing through that is very, very true to form and, and true to real life. Yes. And as you're talking about like the isolation and wanting to emote and I think about like when they're, she's now part of the dance Mm -hmm. and she wins because in grief, we're just kind of going through the motions. We're Mm -hmm. not always aware of what we're doing. We're just, okay, I'll go until it stops. And these little moments where she's connecting Mm -hmm. with people and you can see her actually enjoying herself and Mm -hmm. being present and being happy. And then like Anna said, then in the barn, when they're crying, that that's what she needed. She needed people to cry with her just to be in that experience Mm -hmm. and not to judge her. Christian was judging her. His Mm -hmm. jerky friend that peed on the ancestor tree was just break up with Mm -hmm. her. No, 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 no. Yeah. And I think it really, the film shows like unsupportive people and their behaviors and you know our our quote-unquote victims in the film they're not very likable so it you know it, it's it's not hard when you realize they're um you know gone a rooney <laughs> but i really i got into an argument with a good friend of mine about the end i think that what danny does in terms of deciding for christian is the most humane, caring thing that she can do. So she's been through all this. He's put her through plenty of it that made it much more difficult for her to process her own grief journey and experience, yet she's still mindful and kind enough to say, you know what, he's not going to have much of a quality of life if he's bound to this body for the next 40, 50 years. Sacrifice him. I'm like, what did your friend say? Because you thought like she was doing it out of an act of kindness. Mm-hmm. So he, and yes, he he's a cisgender male, straight. Um, he thought she was doing it out of cruelty and um, avenging how he treated her. And I'm like, dude, no, you missed the whole point. <laughs> mm-hmm. So we we still to this day have agreed to disagree but we we do get into it every now and then about that scene but I think at the end too her smile to me is like it's relief like oh my gosh you know I'm going through this experience I'm not alone anymore I have support I found where I want to be and I actually in my brain I always like to add like more endings than what happens I'm like the guy that was like the exchange student like she ends up with him they end up like wasn't there like a picture of them like on one of the tapestries or he drew one isn't there yeah Yeah, there's a picture somewhere of like them it alludes to them being together yeah or prophesized or whatever yeah and i was like oh you know (laughs) it made me happy which it makes sense too because like obviously you're gonna have to bring in outside people at some point otherwise everyone's gonna be inbred and and that's not you know sustaining the population well, that's why they had the whole um, lose your virginity 
sex scene because yeah. they had to bring in new mm-hmm. DNA. Exactly. So when you think about it, like Donnie and Christian, there's two new, you know, contributors to the group in different ways. So they're going to have offspring, you know, and then mm-hmm. it'll work out. Yes. Mm-hmm. And I think, too, like, just like Christian's friend, like the pisser, the disrespect that he shows, like, these people have taken you in, they've clothed you, they've fed you, they've been nothing but kind to you, and you're literally, like, you could have walked over to the bathroom and used it, like an Mm -hmm. outhouse, you know? Right now, you're just going to piss on a tree. Yeah. Without even asking. Like, Like you said, it shows... As you're saying, like, this movie's more about, like, Western culture Mm -hmm. judging other cultures that they don't understand and then being upset or hurt or Mm -hmm. even as you're talking about, like, discussions about this movie, how people are saying, like, well, it's a cult. It's their culture. This is how that this is what they do just because we don't understand it does not make Mm -hmm. it that way. They didn't have some charismatic leader that was trying to brainwash all of them into... No, it's it just, doesn't just show the aspects of the cult. Yeah. It's just the normatives of their rituals and traditions, right? And um, I mean, even if we look at, like, and we mentioned this earlier, the whole um, menstrual focus, um, you know, in some certain cultures, um, and I, I can tell you that, like, in some, you'll find in some, like, Latino and Hispanic cultures, the menstrual blood thing and other cultures as well um historically if you um you know menstruate and then you put it into something that your partner consumes it keeps them bonded to you um i'm not saying that people do that now so if if you're dating someone of hispanic descent they're they're not going to like free bleed into your pizza okay but i'm just saying historically <laughs> if we look back <laughs> It was a practice to kind of continue bonds with someone uh, and and kind of solidify that relationship. Um, But it's just, um, you know, not something that's done today. However, that really kind of caught my attention because I'm like, oh, I'm I'm familiar with with this in terms of like you know, the historical anthropological perspective. And I thought it was kind of brave to have that in the film because, you know, menstruation grosses people out to begin with. So when you're adding all these other things, um, you know, it's bad enough to find a hair in your food if you find a pube at a restaurant. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? <laughs> yes. And I love how you're touching on the normalization of women's bodies and in Western society, again, we've become very crude. Like mm-hmm. our ancestors, those of you that are of Greek or Roman descent, like a man that was injured in war would co return home and have sex with a woman who was menstruating because they mm-hmm. felt that menstrual blood had healing powers. Yeah. So it was like, there used to be traditions that when a woman started her period, this was something to celebrate. This meant mm-hmm. that she could give life. And now in our society, it's very much like, oh, you're in your period. I don't want to hear about it. That's so disgusting. Yeah. Ew, it's so gross. And right. No, it's if there if women didn't menstruate, none of us would be here. Exactly. Like it happens. It's fine. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, and it's just the way it's changed. I mean, even, like, if you look at, like, um, quinceañeras, right? Mm-hmm. So, historically, I mean, there's a lot of history to it, too, which we won't get into. But part of that is you're a woman now. Well, what happens to you biologically to qualify you as a woman in the history of that event? Mm-hmm. Right? You, you're yeah. menzies. So, um it's a huge it should be celebrated though um it should you know, be it should be like yay you started yeah. your period not yeah. oh the curse has happened or however we right. refer to it 
It's like, hey, this has happened. Here's a bottle of my novel and some advice. Like, that's what should happen. Um, Yes, where are our celebration stories? Like, you're touching on, like, so tragically, so many women, I know, myself included, we don't have, like, great stories about starting our periods. I started mine. I freaked out, of course, you know, even Mm -hmm. though you learn about it. You go to the bathroom, you have blood in your underwear. I tell my mom. She gives me, I don't know, $5 and says, okay, go to the store. Mm -hmm. What am I? Yeah. Okay, go to the store. And my little sister went with me. And I just remember us like staring at the aisle, Mm -hmm. like just like being like, what do uh, do I pick? And then you learn from your friends. I use this pad. Mm -hmm. I use this tampon. And all of the education we as women yeah get I'll give my mom credit she did like we did sex ed and girl scouts Mm -hmm. and my school did sex ed there's still a lot that was missing that I got educated by from my friends who Mm -hmm. had started their periods before me oh yeah yeah and it's I I too well I was 10 so it was pretty early on and uh, I cried (laughs) and um I just uh, I remember, though, then I was like, my mom was super understanding. My grandma was very supportive, too. But I remember, like, one of the neighbor boys was, like, five or six years older than me. And he worked at the drugstore. And I was, like, psyching myself out. I'm like, I can go in. I can buy feminine items. I can do this. I can do this. So I was, like, all proud of myself, like, walking in. I think I was had turned 11 by then. And I, like, get the box. and. I go up, and who's working but none other than my neighbor. And, of course, I was mortified. Like, to him, it's just, you know, let me scan this and take your money or whatever. But I was just like, oh. <laughs> because, yes. you know, when you're, you know, preteen, adolescent, those things are very horrifying. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So a movie that celebrates life cycles and mm-hmm. even... As Anna and I are talking about, the the grief that happens as you then are leaving your childhood and moving into adolescence Mm -hmm. and how life is changing. Yeah, totally. And uh, yeah, The Midsummer, it's it's great. I mean, I can't say enough good things. I think it's a wonderful film. Um, Very cathartic. It helped me a lot in my grief journey. Um, I don't know if I would recommend it to other people because everybody's grief journey is different. And in that way, I think it's great just for watching value. But if you're going to watch it, if you haven't seen it yet, go into it with an open mind, open perspective. Keep some sort of levity when you're considering your own values and culture and traditions versus what you're seeing because it is probably going to be vastly different. Yes, And it could be activating... For a lot of people, like Anna is saying, because even though it does touch on grief, we're talking about like traumatic grief and even mm-hmm. cultural related traditions where the the older people, they're, I can't remember what age it is that they turn. And so in this culture, mm-hmm. a couple, they complete suicide. They jump off the cliff yeah. and this is like a huge honor. And a lot of people were horrified. Mm-hmm. I was sure my mom did assisted suicide. And I feel like she would have loved, like, she would have got that. Like, yes, Mm -hmm. they were of the age. It was time. This is what you do. You have power. You have say. And so this movie takes suicide where it's in response to mental illness and feeling like you can't escape Mm -hmm. and wanting to die because you are trapped to suicide because you're at the end of your life two very forms of suicide and tell me if you disagree and our society puts those two suicides together they treat them as if they are the same kind of suicide they are very Mm -hmm. different one is because somebody is in a lot of pain and they have no hope the other one is because somebody is in pain and they are dying they are terminal they have an illness that is Mm -hmm. going to kill them and they're their pain's not going to get better. The mental mm-hmm. health person, their pain can get better. Somebody with a terminal yeah. illness, their condition is yeah. going to get worse. 
Yeah. And I think a lot of it too is, you know, in the United States, this Western society, we are a very Christian based society. Um, and so the viewpoint is that completion of suicide is wrong. There's no exploration of that. And I know we've talked about it before. I always go back to ancient Egypt where suicide was actually highly regarded because you're taking control. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I really do wish particularly in, as you mentioned, physician assisted scenarios, we had that viewpoint because, you know, I think everyone should be given that option if they have a terminal diagnosis. Do you want to continue to live, you know, and experience dramatic, quick or slow declines? Or would you like to establish when you've had enough and when it's over? And and I really, I hope eventually... People are much more willing to listen to the reasoning for PAS. Um, you know, I always think about Dr. Kevorkian um, and how kind of, I, I was just a child. And I remember like, you know, they were talking about like his patients and I was like, I thought he like killed his patients. I thought he like took a scalpel in and like hacked up his patients because I was mm -hmm. a kid. Um, and, and now as an adult, it's not that at all. And um, you know, then you hear stories of nurses who are like angels of mercy and, and these sorts of things. And I think it puts a lot of medical community members in a very difficult position as well. You know, this person is not going to get better and they're begging you not to let them continue suffering. Um, that has to be very difficult for the provider as well. If you have no solution. Um, yes. Or you're legally not able to offer a solution. So you have to actively watch somebody mm -hmm. die. And you also touched on, right, that sense of control that suicide gives people, like in ancient Egypt. And in our Thanatology program, I read articles where people actually, and some countries are looking at assisted suicide also mm -hmm. being approved for people with mental health because they really started to look at what is our definition of chronic pain and inescapable yeah. pain so that if somebody has a mental condition, like somebody with a physical condition, why is that not applicable? And again, this is very touchy subject. We can see with the movie, how people mm -hmm. respond to this. This is a very polarizing subject because like Anna said, here we are a very Christian based society. We are also very um Lazarus effect, which means our medical community, I can save you, I can fix this life, mm -hmm. life, 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 life. And we're very death adverse. So oftentimes we look at life, just life, not yeah. quality of life. As long as somebody's living, that's more important than mm -hmm. the quality of life that they are experiencing. So this is a really hard topic for a lot of people. It's really sensitive. And the movie brings that up. Like Anna was saying too, about when Danny decides that Christian's going to die, she sacrifices him. Was that out of compassion? If you listen to us, you know, we've also talked about end of life decisions. Mm -hmm. If somebody, you know, is not going to have a quality of life, we could basically say Christian's yeah. on life support at this time. Right. Does Danny keep him on life support or does she do the compassionate, empathetic thing and says he's not going to have a quality of mm -hmm. life. And has also touched on in previous casts, how we treat our pets. We will euthanize our pets if their yeah. quality of life is questioned, but if it is a human we will hold on to them and yeah. diminish their quality of life. Right. And oftentimes I think the question we have to ask ourselves is, is this do being done for my benefit or for their benefit? And that's a very, very tough question to have to ask. Yeah, I love that question. I think that's a wonderful way for our listeners to start to look at Whose benefit is this for? How do I start having these hard conversations mm -hmm. with people instead of like, oh my gosh, suicide. And we just close the door being like, okay, wait, what, what is mm -hmm. going on? Oh, you feel really hopeless. You just had a breakup. You got a diagnosis and mm -hmm. 
this is some this is just a storm and the storm's gonna pass or no actually this storm's not gonna pass you are in antarctica now for the rest of your life so mm-hmm. what what do you want to do how can i support you right completely and you know i think uh, we've we've talked about this before um i said it before i'll say it again no matter what age you are it's never too early to start talking about these sorts of things with the people around you and um i before my current gig i I work in commodities now as most of you probably already know i i worked in the wedding industry for a very long time and um i always said going to wedding shows and, and vendor events and things like that something i thought was missing I thought that a cemetery or funeral home should have a booth. And I thought that an estate attorney should be there as well, right? And people were like, oh, no, it would dampen the vibe and this and that. I'm like, yeah, but this is this is smart. This is realistic, right? You're bonding in the here and now. Do you want to be next to each other in the hereafter? Do you, you know, do you know what you'd want for your future husband or wife? you know, you guys need to discuss these things. This is not, you know, it's not all like balloons dropping from the ceiling and champagne flutes clanking. That's one day, right? People become so concerned with the wedding, they forget about the marriage, you know, or they become so consumed with the, if you're, you know, not even marriage, the relationship label that they forget about the relationship itself. Yes. And I love how you touch on that. How do we just start to make this more of a normal conversation? And as we go back to the movie, we can see Danny leaving this very rigid society that Mm -hmm. does not give room to have these conversations to a society where it is very open. Your death means you're becoming an ancestor. Your death has purpose to it has meaning to it and it is acknowledged and accepted Mm -hmm. where she came from the west where her parents died her sister died nobody wants to talk about it people treat her like she's sick to a society that's like no like we have cycles of life we're all going to die and they only have that ceremony like every what like 38 years or something So I'm guessing for those like 79 year olds, that must have been like a huge honor for them to be like, Mm -hmm. whoa, I'm turning 79 when we have our festival. So I get to be this person because the rest of the other people are probably living into their 90s or Mm -hmm. 80s or whatever. But here's these two people that actually. It's an honor. Like, it's not just Mm -hmm. something that happens like every year. Yeah, it's a huge honor. and um. I think oftentimes, too, if we attach meaningfulness and death, it gives life more purpose as well. You know, how many times do you just see, like, even on social media, like a quote of like, oh, well, when you're dead, nobody will remember you in 100 years. This won't matter. Okay. But when you die, your death will impact other people when it happens. So I guess it does matter because it impacts them and then their lives and deaths impact others and so on and so forth. And yes, I, think, I love how you touch on that, right? That yeah. it's almost like, well, it doesn't matter. So then what is your legacy? And mm-hmm. there's some beautiful ways that people are starting to bring that like QR codes on headstones or virtual cemeteries where think about if we had this like a hundred years ago, like we could go online and we could just look, oh my gosh, this person was a pioneer. This person Mm -hmm. did this. And we're starting to do that so that people, they can live on so we can know who they were and their stories. Yeah, absolutely. And it's great. It's cool. I think we can learn a lot from the Harga as well. Um, it just, once again, that theme of community and support and not just thinking of our own individual selves, but also the group. Um, yeah, it, it's worth examining. It's worth looking at and thinking about and having some introspective moments in relation to. 
Mm-hmm. Yes. So, Margaret, who do you yeah. most relate to in this movie? Oh my gosh, that is a great question. Mm-hmm. Who do I most relate to in this movie? Oh my gosh. I can relate to Danny in mm-hmm. a lot of ways, but I don't think like that. She's my main person. I'm going to say I most relate to. I Oh my gosh. I do not know. I, oh. I'm going to pass it on to you. Let me okay. think about this. I'm like, who do <laughs> I most relate to? I I think I most relate to the leader of the Harga. I mm-hmm. think that she is very kind, thoughtful, caring, hospitable, but she's also got a firm hand that this is the culture, this is the way it is, this is how it's going to be. And um, the way that she leads the people and also kind of keeps the Westerners on this path without putting them fully into the culture. Like, I I think that she is very reflective and intelligent. So she spots who's going to become part of the Harga and who is essentially dispensable for the religious tradition. And and I hope that doesn't sound like super cold the way I say that, but no, I love that answer. I was like, yes, I can totally, yeah, like I didn't think it was super cold. She's just very analytical and and I I enjoy that. And the pride that she has in her community is just, it's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. She's a strong character. And you said she's still very caring and empathetic. Mm Mm-hmm. Okay, I'm going to go with the girl that is dancing with Danny, like, mm-hmm. basically the whole time that makes it to, like, the end with her, that is just, like, there with her, that's, like, smiling with her, and just mm-hmm. feels like she's able to help carry some of Danny's burden yeah. in that moment. So, I'm going to say I'm, I'm most like her. Cool. Yeah. I agree. I think if even when you think about your running circles around the maypole, grief can be very dizzying helps to have someone or something to hold on to um yes yeah oh i like that that's awesome yeah i like both of our answers (laughs) (laughs) well i guess uh you know listeners we're probably gonna hit some other ari aster movies soon enough so uh stay tuned for that let us know in the comments if you have seen midsummer what you thought if you haven't seen it and now you're planning to watch it And until next time, drink your Bruja brew and take a little sleepy sleep in your coffin. We'll see you later. Bye. Thanks for listening. Bye.